we're having Professor um, Effie Avena uh, from uh, ETH uh, Zurich. Um, we, uh, we actually um, interact with each other, uh, not only uh, on the uh, WHO ethics um, uh, and governance uh, expert group, but also uh, it's like a year ago when, when Effie and I was in what economic forum, um, the, 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 the Global uh, Future Council on Ethics Innovation Future. Uh, so at that, at, at that time, I, I do see many problems for uh, yeah, ethics and governance research in China because when, when, when I was interacting with Effie, Effie was so happy to see me because uh, she's like, oh, I finally get someone who's interested in yeah, ethics and governance from China. Maybe you can tell a story maybe at ETH Zurich. Uh, to, to, to say that, oh, no, it's not that Chinese is, is don't really care about AI ethics. There, there are people who is caring about it. And not only me, of course, not only me. So this is why we're, we're, having, we're having many, uh, many participants now for this uh, uh, event on, on the video stream. I can see the number is, grow, is growing. But more importantly, that you see the problem is that what language can bring that to? Because when, when Chinese are publishing mainly in, in, in Chinese, the, it's not really vi that visible to the Western culture. So this is why we need to connect everybody together, not only on this event, but also many uh, other events. So uh, and just because of that, this is the reason why I have to invite Afi uh, to the uh, Eastern Society to talk about uh, what, what you guys are thinking about uh, from different perspectives and, and also as a consensus. Uh, so, um, so, Effie is, is, so Effie is someone that I know is not only, Effie may start from bioethics, so the, the correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but, but actually she has a broad interest not only for that, but also for, for AI, data ethics and healthcare uh, ethics and many more. Uh, I'm very grateful to work with Effie, uh, not only at uh, WEF, WHO, uh, but also uh, now to interact um, in, in, uh, online in Beijing. Uh, thank you, Effie. Give it to you. Thank you very much for the very um, warm introduction. Um, it was indeed my pleasure to meet you in person a, a year ago and to discover you know, a person I could talk to about um, ethics from a different perspective. And one, one of the problems we have is, I'm trying to share my screen here, just um, bear with me for one second. Um, I think a lot of um, our issues, particularly in this space, will be um, resolved if we have this kind of communication um, and, and, and links. Uh, can, you share, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so again, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a, it's a pleasure to be virtually uh, with you in Beijing today. Um, what I will do, the area I'm working particularly, my particular interest is in, um, in health. I come from the field of bioethics, so that's where I focus or uh, most of my of my energy, of course, uh, with AI, uh, even if you're thinking about the, its applications in, in health, you quickly realize that um, you cannot separate it from the rest that's going on. But the particular issue I want to speak about today is uh, what I call the long distance between ethical principles and ethical practice. And I try to um, give you some um, a flavor of, of my thinking here. Um, so with uh, like with other technologies, uh, obviously AI as well has inspired and has instigated a lot of enthusiasm and some of the previous speakers mentioned hype about um, how it can be used in healthcare. It has a Wikipedia page devoted specifically to its applications in healthcare. And if you look around, um, you will see that there's incredibly um, increasing um, uh, investment from the private sector, from the public sector in how we can apply artificial intelligence in health and, and, and healthcare. To some extent, this is good news because we do, as we saw with COVID, um, we do need a lot more um, for health and healthcare. At the same time, though, we've been, and, and that's before uh, the pandemic, we've been realizing that as in other sectors, 
um, applications of artificial intelligence uh, in healthcare, they raise a number of concerns. And it's this constant dance between enthusiasm, between expectations and, and concerns. Um, and the concerns, as they were put uh, succinctly uh, in, on this list by the National Council report already in 2018, are about how reliable and safe this technology is. Again, remember, we're talking about health and healthcare where we are typically used or we aspired to test our applications before we introduce them uh, to people. Questions about transparency and accountability. Again, this is quite generic to a number of applications. The question of bias, fairness and equity. Furthermore, the effects that these applications may have on patients, um, the effects that these may have on healthcare professionals, and interestingly enough, of course, the effects they may have on something very important in healthcare, which is the patient-healthcare professional relationship. The, um, wicked issues of data, data privacy and security, and of course, the malicious use of AI. All of these issues are part of what creates our concerns um, around the uh, potential applications of AI in healthcare. Now, I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick example of um, uh, we all had to deal with um, artificial intelligence and COVID-19. Of course, with the pandemic descending upon us, um, everybody was trying to look and use whatever we had in order to control it. This slide is from the OECD, and it's some examples of AI applications at different stages of COVID-19, as you can see here. And this is part of the expectation and the enthusiasm, but you can see applications of AI have already been seen in um, uh, early warnings, um, already before we were actually, the, just with signals, before we were able to identify um, with certainty that something is really going on, prediction of risk that we are con continuously doing, um, delivery of healthcare in terms of response, monitoring how we're, um, uh, how we're doing, expectations go beyond this to diagnostics, to um, surveillance, and that's something I'll talk about a little bit more, um, digital disease surveillance, for example, with contact tracing, um, the triage um, of resources in um, various in, in, in delivery of care, and again, other things that we have seen, for example, uh, which links back to the previous question, content moderation, misinformation, and that through um, uh, automated ways of delivering news and information. So this is just a, a broad a broad and specific picture of AI to some, for example, in the health and healthcare to something that really matters to us very much right now at this moment and globally. Um, but the question when we're using, uh, when all of these technologies could be used to rescue us, uh, if you wish, from um, uh, what we're going through right now is this one. And it was put in a blog by the World Economic Forum quite recently, the question of, is AI trustworthy enough to help us fight COVID-19? Which I think it's a very interesting question because it isn't just about having a tool that we so much hope and, and like to use. It is really, can we trust this tool to do what it's supposed to do? Um, and a lot of the conversation about ethics and both Amandeep and, and Christoph mentioned that is it boils down to whether the systems we develop are actually systems that we trust. Now, in every sector and aspect of life, we need to have that. And health is a particularly interesting example. Uh, coming back again to how we determine or how we make sure that something is trustworthy. To date, a lot of um, thinking and effort has been given into developing ethics guidelines. Um, this is a, a, some work we did a year ago. We stopped collecting guidelines exactly a year ago, uh, well, almost a little bit more than a year ago, um, because we were puzzled by the what I call proliferation of AI, AI ethics principles and guidelines. And we looked, we saw that just until last April, we had about 84 institutions, organizations, uh, public from the public sector, from the private sector, academia, that were producing guidelines for uh, ethical AI. That, that's not specific to health, it's just general AI. 
it was quite, since then, there's been at least another um, 15 uh, sets of, of guidelines, sets of guidelines that have been produced. And what we did in our work, we looked at what are these guidelines saying? Are all these so different or um, have something distinct or are they actually agreeing with each other? They just come from different institutions, from different organizations, from different parts of the globe, which was also interesting to look at. And in, essentially what we saw in this analysis analysis is that we don't really differ so much as far as ethical principle aspiration is concerned. So what we saw is that those 10 principles keep coming up in all these documents, transparency, justice and fairness, non-maleficence, do not harm, responsibility, privacy, beneficence, freedom and autonomy, trust, sustainability, dignity, and solidarity. So again, you could, in our observations, we saw that, of course, not all of them appear everywhere, and not all of them um, are given the same priority in its document, but more or less all documents um, uh, had reference to those. The, the interesting thing we found is that um, not not even a single one was common to all uh, documents, but we saw that at least all of them had, we saw what we called an emerging consensus and uh, around the, the first top, transparency, justice and fairness, non-maleficence, responsibility and privacy. But to some extent, this is good news because it seems that globally we're thinking along those same lines, at least in, as, as far as what matters to us is concerned. Um, What's interesting and relevant to, to the, uh, also to the sustainability question is that the, the principle of sustainability seemed to be on the bottom end of the list and not on the top, along with solidarity. And interestingly enough, both those two principles are very relevant in this current crisis. So again, it, it doesn't mean that people don't, don't care about those necessarily, but it seems that other principles have given more priority. Um, what also we saw is that there are different stakeholders. There might be some sort of disagreement as to what, how its principle is interpreted, but also how the it, the, it is suggested to be implemented. And the question, again, we're trying to figure out is who gets to issue guidelines on, on what ground somebody decides to do that. States do public through the public sector, the private sector, and other institutions. When it comes to um, ethics of health, Interestingly enough, we don't have, again, those guidelines I discussed earlier are generic. They apply to AI as a whole. And again, all of us know that AI is such a huge umbrella. But when it comes to specific AI, um, health AI, what is the ethical guidance there? Um, and here, we, it's hard to say that we have the same proliferation. Actually, we have some specific organizations, uh, uh, individual organizations that have produced something along the lines of guidance. Um, the American Medical Association, uh, the uh, National Health Service in the, U in the UK, the Code of Conduct for Data-Driven Healthcare Technology, which involves quite a lot of guidance in relation to um, artificial application in health. But we don't have the, um, this sector um, in particular, we don't have the sort of, you know, solid list of guidance that um, we would, uh, that could, could help us with the specific sector. Again, we're deriving from the um, general one. And in this context, uh, I'd like to mention the effort that WHO began actually before the pandemic, back in October, uh, it set up an expert group to develop ethics guidelines specifically for the domain of health, which um, I welcomed and I, I have the privilege to co-chair this group, uh, and he is as a member of our group, um, which aims to not produce another set of guidance, but to do two things. First, to produce um, guidance that are specific to the sector, because what we found is also uh, the, the need to translate those principles into particular sectors. And the second is to produce guidance that hopefully uh, will be very linked to implementation and practice, not just um, the theoretical or the abstract or the high level principles. We're in the process of this um, work um, uh, and we hope maybe by the end of the year or the beginning of the year, we will be able to, to have this document. Of course, with the pandemic, we were a little bit um, uh, sidetracked, uh, all of us. Um, 
going back to um, uh, to this to this linking of points, um, when OECD, I showed you earlier the slide with the possible ways in which AI can help us uh, for the specifically the COVID nineteen um, crisis that we have. Um, it at the same on the same page, and 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 you can you can visit that and and, and take a look. Um, the Next to the how we're going to do that, um, there was this bullet point that again to realize this full promise of AI, policymakers must ensure that these systems are trustworthy. Again, the theme of trust comes back, and in this case, OECD proposes that they are aligned with the OECD AI principles. Again, there's a number of principles, but in the follow-up, you see that it comes back to these basics respect human rights and privacy, and be transparent, explainable, robust, secure, and safe, and all those actors that are involved in the development and use should remain accountable. So again, we're going back to these important themes, no matter where they've been issued from, by, uh, whether it's OECD or um, another issue of the European uh, Commission, um, at the end of the day, this is what we are aspiring to do. Um, and let me give you an example of where despite our um, aims and hopes and, and, and reminders that this has to happen that way, I think we have a long way to go. Um, the, and I'll take, I'd like to take the example of the apps, the, 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 and particularly the health apps or wellness, wellness apps. Now there are two categories there. One is the, those health apps that are considered medical devices and they're going through scrutiny because they fall into a category that were used to regulate differently, for example, like other medical technology or, or drugs. Um, but one of the big hopes around health and AI um, is that in fact, all of us will be able to use technology to prevent disease, to predict disease, so we're not gonna get sick and have to be treated. And, and this is also what we're seeing even in the COVID um, situation. We wanna have tools that help us prevent us not getting sick. So in my view, this is a main area of application because it's the scalable application. It's the one that will help all of us to maintain our health. So if apps is one of those, which is very different from automation or, or AI in a CT scan system or in diagnostics, um, what's been happening with all the high level principles and the, and, and the recommendations about how to, to do this the right way? Now, repeatedly what we see in the lay press, but also in analysis that we did is that those many, many apps that are around, uh, and, and use forms of AI actually don't necessarily meet the criteria that we have um, we we have provided or could be delineated through principles. Um, we did some work with um, uh, a colleague from OECD uh, looking at how we can um, the, what is out there in terms of, of of policy and how apps respond to that. And we found a lot of fragmentation. We found confusion. We found uh, gaps in how principles and aspirations and values about those matters are actually uh, finding, it, uh, finding it difficult to trickle down into each app that we are using. Um, the same, it's going, we are identifying the same for when we looked at how uh, apps are going to be used for COVID-19. Um, we again found issues with how we can ensure consent and voluntariness, how we can ensure transparency, um, what about um, the validation of those uh, systems, um, what about um, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of uh, respect and, and ex explainability of those systems. So we keep seeing that even in something as common and, and, and as perhaps celebrated as apps um, in wellness and health, we see a difficulty in going from the principle to the practice. Um, I'm giving you one example from Switzerland um, that I was involved with the development of the Swiss contact tracing app. Um, I, I'm sure the audience is familiar with all the um, uh, uh, hype and, and, and hope about how apps can help us um, identify who those who have been exposed to an infected case or who can control that um, as part of the efforts to control uh, COVID-19. And in Switzerland, we tried very hard to make sure that we follow suit. I mean, we 
in terms of, of security, privacy, open source, um, uh, anonymity, legitimization through a parliamentary discussion, we went all the way, hopefully, to meet the criteria. It's been a very difficult exercise. And again, I'm hoping it all going to work out. And I'm hoping we were um, going, we will be able to meet all the principles and, and, and satisfy all the criteria. But it has been a very, one isolated case. It's been a, a, a really, um, uh, a lot of effort and thought that was given into that. And again, this app will be rolled out in two days. So I will be able to tell you if we were successful uh, then. But, um, the the uh, the point remains that to 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 translate and to to make possible that those principles are coming into the product that we are having on our phones it's been it is a difficult exercise um again uh, what's the way towards that particularly from this for this project the uh, covid-19 uh, contact tracing um, systems uh, called tracking uh, particularly for the proximity tracking who again produced uh, interim guidance um, we went back to specify what is the particular requirements that this application here is um, uh, supposed to have in order to be basically trustworthy and reliable. And again, from there, we used various pieces. I was, again, I had the privilege to chair this group. Um, we had the, the, the uh, possibility to look back to principles for AI um, and, other, and other systems and other, and other guidance, and to again become very concrete for this particular technology. Um, one of the things that this shows you is that we still have the need to go to translate from the big high level to very specific applications. So how can we bridge theory with practice, which for me is, I think, in the it's the crux of the problem. Um, we, how can we go from, uh, how can we implement these principles? How, how can we harmonize? Because we see there is variation, there is a lot of um, different activity. How can we enforce? Because again, my example from the apps is that it's hard to enforce even if the aspiration is there. Um, how can we move from the piecemeal and ad hoc attempts to something more uh, coordinated and, and cohesive? And how can we avoid this fragmentation that I think we're seeing and some um, of the other speakers uh, mentioned? So in, in, in my view, uh, and I think COVID-19 revealed the pandemic taught us a lot of lessons. I hope we, we will learn um, about a lot of things that we need. And one of those that uh, even in the circles that thinking about AI ethics um, in general and in health in particular, we, we need more coordination. I, I was very happy to meet Yi because I thought, okay, the work we're doing here in Switzerland and in Europe um, needs our counterparts in China and in, in other places. We need to do this kind of thinking together and in, in, in more coordinated fashion than in those sort of um, incremental and, and, and um, uh, sort of fragmented. And um, I still think that awareness about the value of doing, um, in, uh, using AI in health and in general um, in, in ways that meets ethical criteria is still not out there. In some of our circles, we think this is a given, but talking to policymakers, po talking to people who make decisions, it very quickly makes you think that, um, realize that it is not such a given. Um, specifically then, I think the next important step is that Everybody is in need of standards and quality assurance, for, which are very technical issues, but I think it is an, a very good way in um, helping us standardize and, and meeting um, criteria of quality, which are important for um, trustworthiness. Um, and I think we need to become a little bit more creative in terms of how we implement and enforce which part of these ethical principles have to become um, legally enforced, which parts have to be um, uh, 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 in, implement, uh, uh, implemented through more soft law approaches and, and help in the implementation. And finally, I still think we need to think more creatively about incentivizing um, the industry primarily, but on, not only the, the, indus the industry, um, 
in, in thinking, in taking AI ethics um, more seriously than it has. My, my final, um, my, my hope is that uh, one of the biggest lessons that we will get from, from COVID-19 and what it's, it's doing to us, partly also bearing, um, uh, laying bare our, our problems, our inequities, our ethical deficits, is maybe to realize again how important um, the, how important our values are, how important for um, any kinds of, for, for, you know, continuing our life on the planet, um, but also how important they are in terms of becoming a priority, something that we used to have as an afterthought. And, and, and hopefully, um, I believe that, that we can use this tragedy and this crisis to restart um, in, in different grounds for more trustworthy technology and one that um, respects values that uh, more or less I think we see to be important across the globe. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Effie, for the wonderful talk. Actually, I, I think Effie's talk directly answered the question in the chat uh, saying that um, when we heard during the pandemic coronavirus, GPS inflation data is widely used to locate potential infectors in the crowd. Uh, could this suggest, could the guests to provide any advice for policymakers and companies to preserve and manage this information? And just like what Abby told about, not only on the WHO uh, guidance uh, that she lead and me and also Adrian involved, uh, but also uh, that many other perspectives. I would like to add uh, that if the question itself from Chinese uh, participants, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, actually in China, we, we don't, it's not that we don't really have that policy. Actually, the Ministry, uh, the Ministry of um, Industry and Information, Ministry of Healthcare, and also the Cyber Ministry of Cybersecurity, they actually launched a, a four ministry policy uh, on the, the information uh, regulation for COVID-19 saying that uh, if the data or the data is specific, specifically for this period, if you would like to use it or extend it, so you have to do the user, uh, the, the informed consent again for, the, for those who has been collected uh, for these data. And then you have local, local ministry saying that, oh, can we extend the use of this data, ignoring what the government has already said. And then you got like, under the trends that they say, you got like more than 10 million people say that we don't like it. So you see the you, you see that uh, really that um, like my colleague in here has been discussing multi-stakeholders, you, you have to take your own responsibility, not only at the government level or the local uh, community level, but also for, for the AI uh, companies and, and, and even gatekeepers like with um, sad. Um, so I would also like to add a, echo what Emma Deep says that saying that ethical, ethical values is weak, but it's not. Based on Emma Deep, it's, he said that ethical seems weak in the short term, but it's very powerful over the long term. Uh, the example could go for uh, Mahatma Gandhi and, and British rule, which is really uh, True, but just like what we've been discussing, uh, that not only ethical rules, uh, that, that's something as a starting point, but following by many um, policies and laws um, that everybody's taking their own role for, for self-governance, not only rely on the government itself. Um, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't cost too much time, but I would thank you so much, Effie, uh, and please join us for the discussion. Uh, later, if you can.